Good afternoon, and welcome to the Etchick Podcast. And uh, our subject today is going to be uh, the uh, circumstances that surround the economics that are, quite frankly, uh, affecting negatively both independent pharmacies and uh, small and medium-sized employers because of the crushing cost and increasing cost of prescription drugs. And we're very, very lucky to have as our guest this afternoon, Lisa Fast, the founder of Diversify Rx, and has spent many years in the uh, independent pharmacy community. And uh, Lisa, you know, welcome. Why don't you just tell everybody a little about a little bit about yourself, a little bit about Diversify Rx, and uh, how we all got to know each other. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Howard, for having me on. I've always been a big fan of Etchik since I first was introduced to you guys several years ago. So I am Dr. Lisa Faust. I am the CEO and founder of Diversify Rx, which is my passion project company that is devoted to helping independent pharmacies improve their profitability. And we do that through revenue diversification, operations improvement, um, understanding the KPIs and benchmarks, uh, really just all of the tools that, that, that you would learn in business school instead of pharmacy school, but instead a lot of us went to pharmacy school. So I am a pharmacist by education and a passionate enthusiast for entrepreneurs and independent pharmacy. And, you know, Howard, I think you and I met probably close to four or five years ago. I don't know. It's been a while. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, when I was learning about what you were doing and it resonated so well with me because many years ago when I had my first pharmacy, I actually started my own transparent PBM and, you know, wanted to try to bring it to the employers. And uh, obviously I stopped doing that whenever I sold that pharmacy. And so it was so great to meet somebody that um, understood, well, you understood it far more than I did, but really understood the impact that it could have on not only the local employer, but also the local independent pharmacy and how it can help them operate their pharmacies in a better financial position. And, you know, by kicking out those, uh, unneeded middlemen, uh, the PBM. So uh, it's great to uh, talk with you and happy to uh, dive into this topic so people can better understand uh, the landscape that we're dealing with. Well, thank you. And you know, some of the people that are going to uh, hear our podcast who tune in are employers who are impacted by the cost of the medical and pharmacy services that their people use collectively. And uh, for the most part, I think the biggest disadvantage that uh, the average employer has, and I've seen this true even in the field of uh, independent pharmacies who provide benefits to their own people, is the PBMs. And uh, uh, if I can ask you to kind of um, talk about what the PBMs have done and how they position themselves and how they impact cost to the consumer, and then we can talk about how they impact the bottom line negatively to the independent pharmacy and how if we can get past them, the consumer's cost will go down and the pharmacy's stability will go up. Yes, so absolutely. That's, that's a whole uh, lot of stuff. And I could probably talk for hours about all of that stuff because I, I tend to get on my little soapbox. But um, just for you know any employers that may not quite understand where the PBM fits into all of this, the PBM is often referred to as the middleman because they are in the middle of a transaction for a prescription. PBM stands for Prescription Benefit Manager. And so they are the ones who implement your prescription benefit as an employer to your covered employees. And the PBM from the pharmacy, the claim, the, the and you know, it's all data and electronic now, but the claim goes from the pharmacy. It goes through a switch to the PBM. The PBM decides what they're going to pay the pharmacy, and that data flows back to the pharmacy. And then on the other side, the PBM takes that claim data, sends it off to the employer, bills the employer, and then, of course, that money flows back to the PBM. So the PBM's in the middle between the employer and the pharmacy. Those are really the two parties that are, that are needed in this process. You need the employer and you need, you need the pharmacy. And, you know, recent years as Howard has been working tirelessly is you don't need the PBM. Um, the, the processing that they do, 
can can be very needed. You know, it, it, it electronically it keeps things moving. But what they do is they shroud their services and the costs in in mystery. Uh, that's where the word transparency comes through and fiduciary comes through. Is is they don't do that these days. You know, the typical PBM um, clouds. The employer doesn't know what the PBM pays the pharmacy. The pharmacy doesn't know what the PBM charges the employer. And that ambiguity allows the PBM to rake in a ton of profits. And it's, it's often referred to as spread pricing. And because the PBM charges uh, the employer one price and they pay the pharmacy often a lot less than that price and therefore they get to keep the the middle the the spread the, between those two and so that's really the the crux of the problem that we're dealing with and it hurts employers because it inflates their costs um it it unnaturally and unnecessarily inflates their costs now if a pbm does transact and process claims they deserve to get paid for that absolutely However, they don't deserve to uh, have all of these costs shrouded in mystery and for employers to think that all of this money is flowing through uh, to the pharmacies. And um, I know I can speak from my own experience of presenting these kinds of health plans to employers and you might be thinking, I, I picked a good plan. I'm with a, you know, a, a reputable nationwide company. This can't possibly be happening to me. But there's been many times where I've done evaluations and I know Howard has done too that um, savings are six figures, you know, hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars savings, and it can be a shock to you as the employer or the HR manager because um, you feel a little dumbfounded. You feel um, just completely bamboozled. I mean, for lack of a better better word, and and you start to doubt your own decision making. And all I can say is, uh, don't take it upon yourself. Don't feel guilty. These PBMs are trillion dollar companies and they have created this entire system to pull the wool over your eyes. So don't feel bad that, that you got there, um, but just listen to Howard and his team to figure out how you can get out of this game that the PBMs play. And you can do these nice direct contracts with pharmacies, um, leveraging even some PBMs sometimes because you might have a big workforce in lots of different areas, but it's going to be a different kind of PBM that's transparent, so you know exactly where every penny is going. Would would you um, <clears throat> agree with our point of view that if an employer could be shown how to be able to bypass the PBM's uh, middle middleman involvement and work directly with their local independent pharmacy, um, would we be correct in uh, indicating that the, the value and the cost of services they would receive would be less costly to them? And uh, even though that um, <clears throat> the independent pharmacy might be able to have a better margin if they, they set their own selling price. Absolutely. What you're able to do is you're able to cut out that fat. And the fat is the, the, the fee and the, the spread that went to the PBM. So I like to give a really easy example using a fictitious drug, drug A, um, and we'll just pretend that the, the, the drug A, the cost that the employer is charged by the PBM is $50, and the amount that goes to the pharmacy is $5. Well, where does that other $45 end up? Well, it ends up in the pocket of the PBMs. So let's take the model that you just talked about where the employer is working directly with the pharmacy, the pharmacy, uh, instead of it being $50 to the employer, the pharmacy could charge $20 to the employer, uh, thereby reducing the cost of the, the, the drug. And instead of getting paid $5, which was actually $3 below their cost, they're now paid $20. And so they get to make a, a typical $10 margin on a prescription. The payer saved 30 bucks and the pharmacy actually made a, a livable profit and everybody is happier, um, except, of course, the PBMs. <laughs> but uh, yes, it, what you're able to do by this direct, transparent type of pricing is you know exactly where every penny goes. And in this day and age, I don't care what industry you're in, you've got to optimize every bit of revenue and every bit of expenses that are going out. And so if you could reduce your expenditure by providing benefits, and let's face it, we have to provide benefits these days. If we're gonna attract good employees, I'm a big fan that you, you gotta have benefits. 
you might as well make your dollars go as far as you can and even probably get dollars back because it, it really does, it dramatically decreases the amount. Um, Howard, you and I have been there when you've talked to employers and when you see the actual reports, when you get a report from your insurance company and you get a report from your local pharmacy of what they were paid and the, the amount of difference between what the employer paid and what the pharmacy was paid was is, is easily in months, tens of thousands of dollars difference. Um, that's what's just going into the PBM pockets and out of yours. You know, we have uh, heard from some independent pharmacies that uh, the tandem of the insurance companies and the PBMs are actually paying the pharmacy for some drugs that are being accessed by an employer group less than what it actually costs them to put on the shelf from their wholesaler. Is that accurate? Yes, that very much is. You know, about six to eight years ago, the normal, what we call negative margin, which is where you're reimbursed less the cost of the drug. We're not even including the cost of the vial or the labels or the, the labor. This is not even including that, but just the cost of the drug used to run about six to 8% of claims were negative. Um, nowadays, unfortunately, that's, that's creeped up, not just by a little, but, but by double. It's about 15% of claims are now negative margin, means the pharmacy loses money. They don't even make enough money to cover the cost of the drug, much less all of the labor and operational costs either. And so this has become a huge issue where the cost to the employers are going up, the reimbursements are going down, and that's why PBMs are keeping that spread in the middle, and they're beating Wall Street's expectations year in and year out uh, because they keep charging more and paying out less. So what you're saying then is that 15% of the time, the insurance company through the PBM is actually paying less than cost for some of the drugs that are being covered by these insurance plans while the employer is buying these drugs with a premium that incorporates the markup that the PBM has as well. And, and uh, the spread becomes that much more and the employer themselves have no idea this is going on. And the independent pharmacies have little or no way of imparting this information to the marketplace. Would that be an accurate statement? Yes, absolutely. Employers often have no idea um, that the pharmacies are actually get so little of the money that they, they spend um, on their drug spend. And you're absolutely right. Um, there's, there was actually laws in place before, and it's against PBM contracts for pharmacies to discuss the uh, amount of money that they lose in the reimbursement. Um, pharmacies are not allowed to tell a patient, um, I'm losing money on this claim. Um, some states have passed some laws that, that have made those types of rules uh, unenforceable, but that, that's how bad these PBM contracts are is, is first of all, they're, they're non-negotiable, they're take it or leave it. Um, but second of all, pharmacies couldn't even voice the, the, the problem that's happening. And 15% and is an average, Howard. There are some plans where 30 to 40% of claims are negative um, with some groups. Uh, and, and so 15% is an average. It's, it certainly uh, can get a lot of worse. And so sometimes when you have small towns where there's maybe one or two major employers, if, if they have some of these plans that are really detrimental, you know, they're paying a premium, like you said, they are paying top dollar uh, for drugs. And yet the pharmacies are getting even less than their cost um, to buy the drugs. And and it is a real problem. It's a problem for the employers because they're spending too much. And it's a problem for the pharmacies because many pharmacies have been forced to close. You know, we're all aware that thousands of pharmacies have gone out of business in the last several years and created pharmacy deserts in a lot of, a lot of locations. Lisa, one of the things that I've seen that is working against the um, average small and medium-sized employer who is continuing to access benefits through these uh, inflated premiums where they have absolutely no means to find out what they're being charged, you know, is that uh, on an anniversary date, when the premium would uh, go up 10%, that means that to the employer, the cost of their drugs just went up 10%. But on an anniversary date, if, you know, um, <clears throat> 
the drugs are sitting on the shelf already with that pharmacy, the cost, the, uh, the cost of those drugs didn't go up 10% automatically simply because a certain date came around. Would that be accurate? Oh, yes, absolutely. So uh, the employer gets these, we, we think of them as automatic increases. You know, they're not supposed to be. They're not, they're not written in that way, but we all just assume another 10% increase. But it's like, why? Well, you know, generally cost of drugs go down, you know, as things become generic and they're on the market longer and there's more manufacturers typically those costs go down and yet employers never ever see their premiums go down in a typical model. Um, never as, I, I mean, I've been an employer of many different businesses and when I had the traditional insurance that, were, that most of us have, never ever did my premiums go down for my group. But yet as a pharmacy owner, I certainly know that uh, drug costs just don't automatically go up every year either. One of the things also that we've seen as a, a, a method to try to neutralize the PBMs institutionally is, as you were talking, uh, that um, oftentimes the pharmacy system tries to, through legislators, you know, impact the PBMs through legislation either on a state or federal level, which can take years and still end up an exercise in futility. Uh, and what we have seen is that if a local employer community and that local pharmacy in that community could easily neutralize the PBM impact by just working directly with each other, would that be an act, Would that be a better method and a better way to go, given an opportunity to do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there are many legislative fights both at the state levels, you know, the, in the news lately, there's, you know, Ohio Medicaid is suing their PBM. They realize there's many states that are doing that, but lawsuits take a really, really long time. And even if they win, uh, it, it's not always cut and dry. And so the best way to get around it is to not, not have the PBM in the first place. And the employer, it, it's not as complicated as you might think to just partner with your local business, local to local, um, come up with that drug cost expenditure math. It's, it's usually pretty simple math. And it's amazing. The pharmacy actually makes, I'll say more money because they're, they're not losing claims. They get paid a fair, you know, 10 bucks or something like that um, as a dispensing fee plus, you know, their, their operational costs. And then all of a sudden the drug spend on the employer's side is immediately cut. I've seen 25, 30% just automatically um, because you're not paying all of that fat and all of that profit to the PBM. And so um, this really can be figured out quite simply, um, especially with computer systems and such these days. Um, it does not have to be a complicated process. And then you keep all that money in your community. You know, that's one of the things that we haven't talked about, but when you're sending all of that money to the PBM, it's obviously going to a corporation, which then, you know, gets dispersed all through that. When you send it to your local pharmacy and you keep it in your local community, you're actually helping your own local economy better um, instead of sending money out of it. And so I think that's a really good thing as a small business owner and someone who's been pride themselves on, on trying to support your local community. Nothing better than keeping that local money uh, there. See, I, in, in my opinion, I, I think that the, uh, the average independent is missing the boat by not providing, you know, th this type of information directly to their local employers. And the local employers are missing the boat because the biggest hurdle that a pharmacy may find or anybody in their uh, advocacy would find is the unwillingness of the appropriate decision makers at any employer to just listen. Just listen and, and, and see where they're getting taken advantage of. And the fact that the employers won't listen, they're doing a disservice to their own employees because they're forcing their employees to pay inflated prices through premiums for their own product as well. And, and uh, that's why I, I think it would be uh, to, to the um, advantage uh, of the average uh, pharmacy to become a little bit more vocal in their local system about the economics that the insurance system won't let them see. Have you seen that uh, as well? Absolutely. I mean, most pharmacists don't understand insurance. I know as when I first opened my pharmacy and when I was a practicing pharmacist at a, at a regular uh, you know, retail chain, I had no idea 
Um, because we don't see it again. It's it's everything shrouded in this, you know, secrecy and proprietary formulas. And it wasn't until I had met some people in the insurance industry and I, I started talking to them that I really understood the problem. So the typical normal pharmacist, even pharmacy owner does not have any idea about this. And that's where I think awareness comes in. And I think also Howard on the other side is there needs to be some open-mindedness on the employer side. As I said before, I actually just talked to one of my friends who's a pharmacy owner and uh, they had actually talked to a local employer and showed them the savings that they could be saving by just going direct with them. And they just said, thanks, but no thanks. And he, he called me up yesterday to find out why, why would they say that? I, I just showed him I could save them, you know, it was almost $100,000 a year for a fairly small employer. And I let him know that as somebody who had a transparent PBM many years ago and did many, many pitches, that it's often the ego of the employer. And, and I don't mean ego as in, you know, they're, they're cocky. I mean, ego as in, I didn't know what I didn't know because especially many of the HR people, this is their world. Insurance is their world. But again, don't feel bad that you don't really understand the games behind the smoke screen that the PBMs are playing because most people don't. Um, and I've talked to many employers that initially dismissed the idea that savings could be that high because they just didn't want to believe that they made a bad decision before. Um, and anybody that's listening to this, that's an employer or an HR person, you have made the best decisions with the information that you had, like that don't feel bad. All you can do is change going forward. And now that you're listening to Howard and realize that there may be a different way, I think you were spot on Howard. And it's just, just listen, just to be open to what is out there um, behind the big corporations and behind the smoke screens that they like to play um, because there could be a better way. It's certainly not the most popular way. Um, you know, they don't, they spend those trillions of dollars wisely on advertising and, and uh, their own agenda. Uh, but there, the alternative way could be a good thing and, and don't feel bad just because you didn't know about it earlier. Um, always just make the best decision with the information you have at that moment. Well, you know, I'm going to draw on uh, the experience I had just yesterday with uh, one of our clients who was concerned about the escalating cost of their drugs. They have people that are uh, spread, you know, around uh, our, our St. Louis uh, metropolitan area, but also in other cities in Kansas and uh, in Iowa. However, <clears throat> you know, um, we look around the room and the people who are in the room giving them advice as to how to access their uh, medical benefits and health and, uh, and prescriptions. And I asked the employer, uh, who's a seasoned, seasoned professional, along with the CFO, I said, Take a look at who's in this room. Do you see a pharmacy professional? No. Do you see a medical professional? No. You see insurance guys. You see insurance guys. What do we know about the pharmacy industry? Nothing. What do we know about the delivery of health care? Nothing. We come in with graphs, with charts, with analytics, with gimmicks, with HSAs, with HRAs, with cafeteria plans, with gap plans, with this plan and that plan and every other kind of plan. But we're not coming in with professionals who know how to deliver the service you're trying to give to your employees. I said, have you ever had a medical or pharmacy professional in a meeting? No. Then how could you possibly be getting the best value and the best advice? Talking to middlemen who make a commission added to every single prescription you buy. I stopped them dead in their tracks. And then we uh, uh, indicated that um, we have made an arrangement with a group of local independent pharmacies to be able to work directly with an employer who would like to. Would you like to look into it? Well, it's something to consider. Are you kidding? Now we've done this. And uh, we found that at the minimum, when an employer uh, uh, works directly with the local pharmacy relative to what they would have been spending on a, uh, a self-funded or self-controlled plan 
working directly with a PBM, an independent PBM that's not as predatory as the Caremarks and the Express Scripts and the Optums and the Ingenio RXs and the Prime Therapeutics. It's a minimum of 13 to 15% reduction in cost. And that's just for starters. So with the experience you've had, have you seen the same reticence, apathy, inertia on the part of the general public and that they're going to the wrong people for advice to get a better answer to what's plaguing them all, all around the system. Absolutely. Um, in, in every bit of insurance, I mean, if you think about Medicare recipients and trying to pick a Medicare plan, who do they go to? They go to the insurance agent that gets paid a commission on you know, what plan they select. Um, and there's been a big push by some, some good, good businesses here in the independent world Go to your pharmacist. The pharmacist is going to be able to one that tells you, you know, what kind of drug class is and what your costs are going to be, um, not the insurance. The insurance person is looking out for the insurance person, um, whereas your pharmacist, your healthcare professional is really looking out for that patient. And again, I think it goes back to just doing things differently, um, admitting to do things differently, admitting that maybe you weren't doing them right the first time. You know, there wouldn't be a whole movement of, helping professionals do things different. I, I always think back to the book of Who Moved to My Cheese, a uh, short little book that's wonderful for everybody if you haven't read it, but um, change is hard. And, and getting in the mindset that is even open to change is really the hardest step. Once you have the open mindset to change, doing the actions isn't really the tough part, but the tough part is unlocking that brain. And it's just when you're coming up with something that is so different than the standard, it just feels awkward and weird and hey I should be doing what all my buddies are doing you know I got 20 other friends that are in HR and they're all they're all going with Blue Cross and they're all going with you know the normal guys um being the outlier is is hard and there's a there's a stigma to it um and that's often why sometimes it has to be the the card holders I'll say that the business the business owner or the board that really has to make that decision because um, that that HR person just doesn't doesn't quite feel comfortable enough to recommend something so brazen and so different. Um, and, and unfortunately, we're blazing blazing trails here, Howard. Um, you know, you're you're one of the, the pioneers and innovators of pushing for this model. And you know, 10 or 15 years from now, I think it's going to be the gold standard. And it's just that heavy lifting that has to happen. Um, and, and people have to want to care about their employees more and care about the company's financial health and kind of be able to swallow that, that uh, pride, that ego, that, that, hey, maybe I, maybe I don't know as much as I, as I thought I did and be just like you said, willing and open to listen. And then, you know what, let's just march forward on a new path that seems to be better. Well, I think a lot of times we're our own worst enemy. Um, about a week and a half ago, uh, we had a follow-up discussion and a call uh, with an independent pharmacy whose pharmacy is actually located within their community hospital and is owned by the community hospital. Hmm. And the hospital itself, with their staff, and the pharmacy as part of that system are insured with Blue Cross. And uh, the pharmacist, rec you know, recognizes how you know uh, futile this really is and how improper this really is and wants to be able to take his pharmacy benefit in-house and take his information to the community. Well, <clears throat> in, uh, in uh, the follow-up discussion, because uh, they originally asked us to you know, do an evaluation for them and show them how they could take control of their program. Consequently, um, he told us that the uh, um, financial officer and the HR director said, well, we're not necessarily going to go any further with this because our broker and his pharmacy guru is coming into, and that's exactly the word he used, is coming into the meeting. <laughs> and I, I said, pharmacy guru, you are the guru. You are the professional. And there's going to be an, a, a consultant or a guru that's going to tell them how to sell their product to their people from their own facility 
in, in a way that adds uh, uh, excessive expense in the form of premium to pay the guru a commission and the broker a commission, and yet they are the ones providing advice as to how you should provide your service as a professional who knows how to do it. We've run into that an awful lot of times. Is that anything new? Is that anything that you have not seen? Unfortunately, it's not new. And, and you know, the only way that I have gone around that is um, get a bottle off the shelf and say, hey, how much did we pay for this bottle? Hey, the pharmacy bought this bottle for five bucks. How much is you as the hospital owner, you know, will say paying for this bottle through insurance? Probably 50 bucks. It's like, why in the world would you pay 50 when you can pay five? Like it, it's, it's, why are you paying? Where does that extra money go? And it's like, goes to your guru, you know, as you said, but it's, and it, sometimes the global numbers um, are not what they need to see. They need to bring it all the way down. Here's this one product. I always like to use amoxicillin. Uh, amoxicillin, um, everybody knows amoxicillin. Everybody's probably taken amoxicillin and it's a cheap drug. It's been out for forever. You know, pharmacies uh, can buy it for, you know, a few dollars a prescription. But if an employer looks at what they were billed for an amoxicillin prescription, the average I've seen is somewhere between 30 to $50 is, is somewhere in there is what they're charged for amoxicillin prescription. And yet the pharmacy probably makes, you know, 20 cents if that on one. And when you, when you bring it down to a really specific example, sometimes that causes the light to go off. Um, but when you have these big diffuse numbers that sound really frankly too good to be true too, so much, you know, people have been taught to be leery of too good to be true. And frankly, going direct comes off sometimes a little bit too good to be true. So when you, when you really bring it down to just a very specific example, sometimes that, that helps better. But yeah, um, it's, it's funny. Every guru and expert will, does, will uh, uh, fight really hard not to lose their jobs. And you know, that's what happens with, with brokers and, you know, nothing against brokers, um, you know, as, as a whole industry, there's some really good ones out there, but you know, if you're fighting against them, of course, they're going to fight back. They're going to, they're good. They want that business. That's their livelihood. So. Well, a couple of observations that, um, uh, you know, come to mind as a result of some of the things that we've seen when it comes to the pharmacy benefit, what nobody realizes it's essentially a fixed expense because almost all of the pharmacy utilization are maintenance drugs. So therefore, the, you know, while you used amoxicillin as the example, let's use as an example a group who has a diabetic in their group. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't need an actuary to determine if they're going to be a diabetic. They're a diabetic. Right. And they need certain drugs for the rest of their life. It's a fixed expense. So no insurance company with a PBM as the middleman would charge that employer group less than the cost of that drug <clears throat> than what the cost of the drug is plus their markup. So now that you have an identifiable expense as a result of an identifiable need, the obvious way to do business is to find the best value and find whomever gives you the best advice to get the best value. So therefore, 100% of the employers that I would uh, ask this question to, would you be better off with a pharmacy professional giving you advice or an insurance agent? 100% would say the pharmacy. And then the response is, then why are 100% of you going to the insurance agent? Yeah. And that's a fact. And, that, and that's tran transcendent amongst all the drugs that an employer group really has. So he says, well, what happens if three more people become diabetic? I said, your fixed cost just went up. Now it's just a question of degree, whether it's at a premium price or a network price. Yep. So would that be an accurate assessment from your standpoint? Abs absolutely. And the really great thing is many people have the incorrect assumption, I think there's a myth out there, that the insurance company is helping to reduce their expenditures and optimize their expenditures. Um, but that is just not the case. 
There's many times as a dispensing pharmacist where I was completely perplexed on why a certain drug was covered on an insurance plan when a perfectly, sometimes even better drug at a cheaper price was not covered. And, you know, in addition to the spread pricing that we've talked about, there's the whole rebate game that gets that gets pulled in. And so insurers are not even always optimizing for lowest cost expenditure. So if you take that diabetic, if you work with your pharmacist, they'll definitely help you optimize that, that patient's regimen, you know, whether it's for therapeutic outcomes, helping to reduce the, the overall cost, whereas that insurance isn't always looking at it with the same lens. They might be looking at it as, well, where can we earn more rebates? And where can we um, optimize for, for that outcome? And so, um, but you're absolutely right. Your drug costs are essentially a fixed cost. They're not, you know, I did use amoxicillin, which is an acute medication, um, but acute medications don't generally um, cause the, the uh, burden of the expenditures of drugs. It is the chronic regular medications, whether it's allergies or diabetic or cholesterol. Um, and why would you pay a premium on something that you know is gonna recur all the time. You know, those are the ones that you would want to get as cheap as possible because you're gonna be paying for them as long as that employee is with you. I've also seen, and, I, and, and I'm speaking from personal experience because of what's been offered to us, that the PBMs actually pay uh, uh, brokers and actually pay third-party administrators and actually pay consultants commissions uh, that are derived from adding a certain dollar amount to every drug, which they take off the top and pay these types of uh, representatives a big commission. And um, the drug utilization on self-funded plans are actually generating huge revenue to those administrators when, in fact, it's being portrayed as well, you're self-funded and you're getting the best value and therefore you uh, um, need to continue to go along with this particular uh, uh, supplier. Uh, this goes back some years. And um, we had always insisted that the third-party administrator with whom we work not be the one to arrange the um, connection to the pharmacy component, whether it be directly with a pharmacy or with an independent PBM, that would be transparent and net of any payments. And um, at, and at, at a, uh, an evaluation meeting with one of our uh, larger clients, the president of the TPA who was present at that meeting pulled me aside and said, Howard, look, <clears throat> we just made an arrangement with ABC PBM. And if you move all of your groups to this ABC PBM, you, this will mean right off the bat $100,000 to you guys in, in uh, uh, revenue. Now, we've always advocated that that's not what we want to see happen. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that, you know, if somebody offers you $100,000, you know, you have to think, well, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice and nobody would know about it. We turned it down. Mm -hmm. We turned it down, and we turned it down because that's not that's not what is supposed to be done, and yet that's done all the time. All so, the time. have you seen evidence that consultants who direct you know uh, large employers to PBM arrangements with their respective TPA is getting paid to do that? That that uh, uh, unwitting client doesn't know. Oh, absolutely. Brokers and TPAs, have, right? Yeah. I've had friends that worked at TPAs um, high, high up. And um, I've, I've seen some of these where they, I've seen as low as maybe 20 cents to 25 cents a claim, which sounds low. You're like, oh, well, that's, that's okay. I've seen all the way up to 80, 90 cents. Um, there's, there's even been some above, but, you know, the normal ranges. And you think, oh, well, that's not very much. But you start thinking for large employers how many prescriptions that are filled by all their employees, all the covered lives. So not just the employees, but their family, their children, um, spouses. And it adds up to, you know, employers can easily have thousands of prescriptions a month. And if somebody is just added, and it's needlessly added, uh, 
fractions of a dollar, that still adds up to a lot. You know, a big number multiplied by a little number is still a big number. And um, it's it's really is quite amazing. So no, I've definitely seen firsthand and I know how lucrative those deals are. And they, I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised maybe they only offered you $100,000 because uh, those deals can be worth millions for that TPA to get all of those business in those groups uh, transferred over. Because again, now you're talking millions of claims and they get that, they get that every single time the prescription is refilled. It's not just a one-time fee. It's not just to upload. It's every single time that, that prescription is refilled. And so it's, it's uh, mailbox money, as you might call it, uh, for these agents and TPAs um, out there. So it, it's definitely a problem. To me, it's a conflict of interest. I, I never quite understood how all of that could exist. You know, in, in Medicare, a pharmacist can't steer a patient to a particular plan because that's seen as a conflict of interest. Yet brokers and agents can freely steer, steer them and it can be in their own best interest um, you know, based on the commissions that they make, which I, you know, again, I never really quite understood that. But to me, I've always seen that as a conflict of interest. If somebody's benefiting by helping push me in a certain direction, that I probably should be getting some non-biased advice, some unbiased advice. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people think agents and TPAs or, or other people in that, that area I think they naturally assume they're unbiased because they don't understand how really they get paid and on the back end, and it, and it becomes a, a very, very much steering, very much uh, heavy influential. And I just don't think people know it. Well, you saw, you said, <coughs> excuse me, 20 cents to 80 cents. I'm seeing $2.50 to $5 per script. Two oh, yeah, brokers. probably at the top level. At the company level, yeah, I've seen it where the individual agent, so that's their cut is what they're that's making. Right. But the company and their boss, you know, everybody else needs their cut too. So yeah, it would not surprise me at all that the, the entire company is making dollars that's per right. prescription. Yeah, and, and, and one final observation, um, and this is not a, a unique aberration. Uh, I've talked to a number of independent uh, of pharmacies that have indicated that they have gone to employers and shown them, shown them the six figure differential between accessing directly and through the middleman. And the, the employer's reaction was, it sounds very interesting. I want to check this out with my broker. <laughs> now, they are going to an insurance broker who gets a commission added to the cost of, of their prescriptions to verify whether or not if they cut them out of their commission, they would save money if they worked directly with the pharmacist. Is, is that a unique circumstance? No, it's not. Um, you know, the one thing that brokers are is super likable people. You know, they, they are some of the best salespeople and um, they earn the trust of the people that they're talking with, whether it's deserved or not, that's, you know, for another conversation, but they've earned it. And um, unfortunately that, that happens. Um, I, I see that in, in, in many, too many times. And that's where it's like, great, go talk to your broker, but what do you think they're going to say? You're, you're basically proposing to take away money from them. What, what do you think the reaction is going to be? Um, and uh, it's, it's complicated. It's because you're dealing with those personal relationships that sometimes people have built for years. And again, it comes back to, they don't want to think that they made a mistake, you know, because to, to say Howard's right is to say I'm wrong. And the previous decisions that I made as an HR or as the owner of my business was wrong. And that feels bad. But what you, what I really try to talk, talk to these uh, business owners is don't feel bad. The system was designed to make you think you were making the right decision. You now know new information. It's okay to change your mind. Like it's, it really is a psychological battle. It's not a logical battle. Um, because if you saw the math and it was logic, it would be no questions, no let's, let's go. But it's not, it's, it's up in the head. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Look, no insurance company, no administrator in behalf of a stop loss carrier excuse me, would pay a medical or pharmacy bill 
without detailed documentation, right? And yet, they want every employer group to pay for these services without any documentation because we call it premium. And here's a piece of paper that says, send me $20,000 every month. And, uh, and because you're buying a bunch of stuff and here it is, it, it's, a, it's a blank slate. They wouldn't pay the bill without documentation, but they're telling you, you have to pay the bill without documentation and you willingly do it. So why are we surprised at what's going on? You know, we could talk about this all afternoon <laughs> and I can't thank, I know that uh, we're imposing on your time and uh, you've been so gracious to allow us to do that. Um, would you like to, you know, um, tell people how they can get a hold of you, Lisa, and, and uh, again, how what your services are that would be helpful to a local pharmacy that could be, extend out into the general employer community if they wanted to learn? Absolutely. So DiversifyRx, uh, my best email is info at diversifyrx.com. And uh, give me an email if you have any questions, if you're a pharmacy listening to this, uh, and if you're struggling with profitability, we talked a lot in here about a lot of claims are underwater. If you're looking for those new revenue streams and those new strategies to help you, that's what we're here for. Um, I am on a mission to save every independent pharmacy um, out there because we are losing them too many too fast and it can be stopped. There's plenty of strategies out there and plenty of opportunities if you know how to implement them. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to, even if you're an employer and you just wanna hear some of the insider information from a pharmacist perspective, happy to have those conversations. I, I believe in local business and local companies and you shouldn't be wasting money on unnecessary expenditures. And in this case, we're talking about uh, PBMs um, in the typical manner. So again, info at diversifyrx.com and happy to have a conversation. Well, you know, thank you. And I might uh, say that this, this uh, message extends not only to independent pharmacies, but to employers who are buying these plans in behalf of their, their staff and to any staff member who's being, who's, uh, being charged $2,000 a month to insure their family because it's Blue Cross and they get away with it. Every single person out there should be demanding to know exactly what the cost of services are to compare it to the premium of being charged to buy it with and where the premium is higher than the cost of service. It's, it's uh, patently obvious what you do. Now, we are employers committed to control health insurance costs. ECHIC is the, is the short form. E-C-C-H-I-C dot com is our website. And uh, we sponsor informational webinars uh, to give uh, insight into this beyond these podcasts. Is there anything in, in conclusion, Lisa, that you would like to add to what we've talked about this afternoon? I would just say it's really about mindset. You know, listen to what Howard say, let him do an evaluation for you um, and be open-minded. And it's okay that you didn't know this information before. Um, it wasn't like you were being nefarious or trying to hurt your company um, or your employees. Uh, just have an open mind that there may be a different and better way of doing things. And just because it's the way that it's always been done, doesn't mean that it's always the way that it should be done. So. But Lisa, we can't thank you enough. You have a wonderful afternoon and uh, best of luck in your endeavors to help uh, independent pharmacies save themselves from themselves. You have <laughs> thank a great you afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.